All right, welcome to our mobility meeting, June 4th, 2024. Um, so we need to approve the minutes. Call the meeting. I uh, call the meeting to order. Roll call. And we'll do roll call. You do I, I call them out. Okay. You have a list, Nick, or? <laughs> no, Seth. Charlotte's here. We just have last season's please up. There we go. Davis Ford's here. Bam. Here. Uh, Law. Here. Flynn. Here. Uh, Green. Zuckel. Here. McBabe. Here. Uh, Reagan. Here. And Webb. Here. I have a meeting to order. We did that already. And um, discuss any items with the meeting minutes. If anybody has any um, corrections, feedback. Motion. Uh, you, you make a motion to approve. Any seconds? Second. Aaron seconds. Um, okay, motion passes to approve the minutes. Great. And um, we'll go with citizens' comments. This is right behind you. Start with Christine. Oh, that's that's me. I've, I've never done this before. Yeah. It's, it's come on around to the podium, okay. right up there. And just to tell us your name and your address, your street. I'm Christine Lovell. Uh, my address is 509 Kingsbury Circle. I live in the Woodbridge Town uh, Home Community of Connor. And that's why I'm here. Uh, the intersection of Connor Road at Woodbridge Drive, which is also Marshall Drive across from Woodbridge. They both cross Connor right there. Um, my concern is Woodbridge Drive at Connor Road. Uh, whenever... The stop sign is about is is very visible. That's not the problem. And it's about 15 feet or so back from the center island that separates Woodbridge Drive in in and out at Connor. And people go through the stop sign a little bit. My my what I'm here for is to ask if we can get a stop bar painted on the ground on Woodbridge Drive at Connor. The main reason is people like if I'm if I'm in an Uber, that's the big thing is being in a car where I'm not the driver, people pull out halfway across Connor to make a left going down Connor and you can get T-boned. I mean, the near misses, I can't even tell you, it's ridiculous. So I'm just looking for a safety issue to have a stop bar painted there for the people coming out of Woodbridge Drive to turn left or right or go straight across Connor. We'll take care of that. Yeah. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Drawing. <there. laughs> Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, yeah. Christine. We like those. Oh, those are yeah. good. <laughs> okay, Ben. That's me. I, I didn't really have a comment. I probably didn't need to sign in there, but um, I was just I just came uh, hoping for an update on the Salem Drive uh, traffic study. Um, can't remember. Yeah, well, well, uh, there's really no updates. We've done some. We we'll save it for all business. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so thanks, Ben. And Mary. Yes. I also have never been to one of these, so I apologize. I did not bring visual aids except for my phone. Um, my name is Mary Mank. I live at 250 Pennsylvania Boulevard. And my concern, um, I use Midway Alley, as everybody does on that block, to get in and out to be able to park our cars. Where Midway Alley meets Lemoyne, every once in a while, there will be a car parked sort of right smack dab where the alley meets Lemoyne. So for those of us who live and use the alley to try to get around said car is kind of problematic. Um, and then also it sometimes blocks the sidewalk. So you can't walk your dog without having to walk into Lemoyne Avenue. Um, I brought vision. I mean, I have pictures I took. Uh, it doesn't happen daily, but it's, I've lived there for nine years and I'm finally at the point now where I'm fed up. Um, so I'm coming here to say, can, can you possibly put a no parking sign 
right there at that corner. I mean, you'd think it would be obvious, but people still park there. Um, and I, I can kind of show you what I'm talking about. Let's make that. I was on the email that you sent yeah. to the group. And oh, hi. I'm Rudy Sukal. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. So that you as well. Um, that car that you took a picture of, it was actually legally parked anyway because it was parked in the wrong direction. Well, and that's the other problem is most of the time it's parked in the wrong direction to go down Lemoyne. So they're parking. Yeah. Is it the same car all the time? Honestly, I don't, I'm not out looking for it. I'm not trying to keep track of this. It's just, I see it every once in a while. I'm like, pardon me, damn it. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to get in and out of that alley. I believe company of people code, they, you can't park at the intersection. See, like, right. So, they're parked there. Sometimes they're higher up into the alley itself, um, which then, so like, there's a, a little area there. Um, and then I took some pictures today. So it's usually like right up here. It blocks that. I can take it around. There's my dog. Um, <laughs> but you know, like they, they block that and they block into the alley. And I know that's not really showing you the alley per se, but. But they'll block all of that. And they're not there necessarily terribly long. So by the time I would call somebody, they'd probably be gone anyway. But I'm hoping if we put up a visual aid, maybe they'll think twice about it. And they're usually visiting, I guess, the people who live um, in that duplex. But you can see how it's just sort of inconvenient. Because you have to go really way out to get around said car. Or you have to um, try to cut it in to try to get around the cars off the alley. Oh, that's the alley there. Okay. That's the alley behind that car. Okay. So and they're like, there's the entrance to the sidewalk. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's farther down. And it's not always the same car. It's been happening for, you know, the nine years. I should have oh, yeah, seen <laughs> um, So, see so yeah, how, I mean, that one, it, it's. So they're right on the corner. So they're right on the corner past where the sidewalk starts. Uh, but like you see, like if you're trying to get in, you kind of have to sneak through the car. To yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so this is like a picture of the car being parked there. And so trying to get past that car up into the alley. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Wow. And they're part, usually parked going down the street in the wrong direction like that. Yeah. So yeah. Like if we could just put like a no parking sign or something. Again, it may not stop them. They may still park anyway. But at least I would feel that. <laughs> I mean, it's against yeah. Pennsylvania yeah. to park in an intersection. So, so it'd be normally, best if you can call. And have are these, is this like the same person parking yeah. every time? I, over, park every year, every, every year. But like, so this is me walking the dog today. So you can <laughs> kind of see where they're kind of parked going yeah. into the alley. Mm -hmm. And it just makes it harder to get in and out of the alley. And it, I'm not the only person that obviously uses that alley. I mean, there's probably 20 families. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way from Castle Shannon to where yeah. it stops at Lemoyne. So people are coming and going all the time. And all, that, all, all the garages are in the back. Uh, of they that. are. Um, I'm one of the few people who does not have a garage. So mm -hmm. I just have a parking pad. Um, but, uh, but it's in the back. But everybody on uh, Barth to where it ends at Lemoyne, and then everyone in that one block of Pennsylvania, we all park off the alley. So the trash comes through, recycling mm -hmm. comes through, we all come through. The mm -hmm. trash. No, the trash there? truck goes, the garbage truck goes Imagine. through the alley. It goes through the alley. Oh, so oh, it would never person. make it. It would never make it if that car, if there was a yeah. car parked there. It's not, like I said, it's not an everyday occurrence. It's just enough that probably after nine years gone, okay, I, I've had enough. I've tried to ask the people who live there to please not have people park there because I don't know when people are coming or going. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be behind the podium. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just, it's just frustrating if you're trying, especially... You've got that hedge, so you got to pull out farther around that car to be able to see down the moin so you can come out without getting T-boned. And again, it may not always be the same car. You know, people have come and gone out of that duplex over the years, but it's just, it's, I've seen it twice now in the last month and a half, once at night, once during the day. I thought, maybe I should come talk to somebody here, put up a no parking sign or whatever you deem appropriate. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Rudy, what are the rules around uh, no parking signs? Or you said it's not enforced. Well, I mean, it's already considered a no parking zone. It's just not posted because it it's within an intersection of two streets, right? I see. Yes, that's the, the, just do the angle of that roadway. That's I mean. Against the flows, obvious that you should have pictured right. that. Exactly. That's definitely a, a violation. But um, 
Yeah, that it's not as simply observable as you know if this was a T intersection and somebody was parked right on the corner. So I think that that one is going to require you know when a car is there to you know alert police. Okay. I mean, Bill Rudy, you could pass the message along to Lieutenant Green to you know have keep people keep an eye on it, but. Right. Just in case they're elsewhere patrolling. Sure. When you see only, it, you're walking by, quick yeah. call, hey, there's a car on the corner, and it'll come down and it may only get take more time. Or, yeah, just give them a warning or whatever, and then they'll officially know if it's And, they, and they might the until officer. until then they move out and the next person oh, sure. comes in. Do it again. <laughs> okay. But yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And that's coming on right up on Lemoyne. Yeah. Yeah, if you come up yeah. Lemoyne, yeah. the lower side, yeah. Up the midway alley. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to check and see if there's anybody. Anybody online? Let me go for jump in. We were a little late, but we wanted to speak sure. if possible. Sure. Oh, yeah. Did we get you signed in? I can get signed in. Sorry, I didn't know. Am I allowed to just go yes. Okay, thanks. Hello. I'm Tori Kowalczyk. I'm at 562 Oxford Boulevard. So I'm hoping I get as good a response as the lady over there in the corner. But um, so I'm actually here tonight. So we we recently had an accident on Kelso Road. Um, I have two young boys, seven and 11. So my 11-year-old will be going to Jefferson next year and my seven-year-old will be going to um, so it's difficult from our end of the district to cross that road. Kelso is a, is a pretty bad uh, road. We don't have a lot of options. Um, so that, there was a little boy a couple months ago that you guys probably heard about had a hit and run accident on that, that street. Um, so I guess uh, what had taken place is that he had thought she was slowing down, but she, she didn't think he was going to cross. And so there was a, that collision. Um, so I'm basically here. I know that we're not, we don't have the opportunity to get a sidewalk. I think I watched the last committee meeting, but I was hoping we could try to find an alternative, maybe something creative to help just signal to drivers that there's a crossing for kids. Um, as the summer months come through, it's going to be a little bit more difficult because people aren't prepared. You know, I think we all know the kids walk here in this township, but um, now that the kids kind of want to cross and go see their friends, it makes it difficult. It kind of cuts those kids off from the rest of the activities in the community. So that's kind of why I'm here is to see what we can do to help just signal if there's some sort of like sign that they can press that makes the lights. Because up at Bower Hill, we don't have sidewalks on Kelso. So there's really not a safe place for them to walk to take that route as well. So uh, are you thinking <clears throat> uh, at uh, Moreland at that intersection? So, so Kelso and Pembroke. So, if you go down Pembroke, there's like a grassy knoll that the kids will walk, and they, there's actually painted lines on the road. Um, but it's not very, it's not very clear. Um, the 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 folks driving up the hill don't really see it, and the folks driving down the hill don't really see it. There was a speed study done after he was hit at that location. I don't know whatever came about with that speed study um, and what they plan to do. If anything, do you want to? It's still being looked at. I mean, the data is being analyzed by the traffic engineer. Unfortunately, he wasn't. I think he's online, but he's not uh, feeling well this evening. So, um, the the paper street, if you will, that goes up through Pembroke. If you would continue Pembroke through up to Moreland, uh, from like Oxford Street through. Mm -hmm. Part of that, I believe, was vacated, which means it's it's pro part of the private property uh, owned by the adjacent residents there. Um, I think the other part is still a paper street, but we don't have rights to that paper street. After 21 years, uh, the municipality loses any rights to any kind of uh, unopened streets or paper streets that were included in the original development. So I think it's just an area where 
over over the years, people have found that they use that as a path or a walkway. Mm -hmm. No one's ever stopped them from doing that. So well, actually, Vancouver indicates that it's a safe walking path. Really, from the school. Okay. Yeah. What exactly is the Paper Street? Paper Street is just that. It was when the when the development was laid out. It was laid out to be a street, but it was never developed as a street. Okay. And it was never accepted by the municipality. So after a certain amount of time, uh, municipal government loses rights to that that piece of property, and it it reverts back to the entire development. And really, maintenance it's maintained by the adjacent the abutting property owners up to the center line of that paper street. So with the crosswalk lines, you guys are able to do something on the road, but you're not able to do something. Yeah, and the other signs. Yeah, the other issue that we have too is that's a state road, so. Anything that's done there, PennDOT has to agree or approve. Uh, so that's all to do. I mean, it, it's a step. It's an additional step, and PennDOT has to be involved in that because it is a state road. So is that something that Mel Lemonade would be willing to do? I can't really. I can't really say at this point. You know, I think. I think we still need to. I, I know that the engineer is still looking at the data that was collected. Um, Rudy, I, you, I can chime in for one second, I, anyways. Thank you. Sure. Um, so I, I, the data is, is different than, uh, I haven't actually had a chance to go through that information yet, but a couple of years ago, uh, the municipality did formally request um, PennDOT review Kelso to determine if the speed limit could be reduced from 35 to 25. Um, since it's a state road, we requested they perform that study. PennDOT performed that study and, and issued a report and summary to the municipality that it cannot be lowered and, and that it's posted correctly at 35. So we we have we have made that attempt already to have the speed limit changed and that's been denied. So now we're looking at other options. Okay, so the speed study that was collected after the little boy was hit, is that the same study or is that a different study? Because I think there was a like a speed tracker put on the right side of the road. I think that was yeah. just a special. Yeah, that was different. Okay. We collected enough preliminary data to see what the volumes and the speeds were for that road. Okay, I just wasn't sure what it was in terms. I mean, yeah, the police department system. has devices that they can use for that to, to collect that type of data, mm -hmm. and that's what it was done. It was a first step, basically. Uh -huh. All right. Um, yeah, just the point of reference. I just pulled up the safe walking route map. I don't see the paper street through there. They only show it on the roads, um, which is typical of right. You know the designs that they do. Um, so it's not a safe walking around um, through there, but I totally appreciate that the kids are doing it. You know, yeah, I would do it too. Um, uh, this is Kelso, as you can tell, is a complex one because it, we don't have site control. Um, but obviously, it's also one that everybody's aware of. Yeah. Um, and you know, we definitely are hearing the residents express concerns. Um, you are clearly not alone. Yeah. Um, yeah, and. I think it's great, really going to be a question of yeah, how do we build momentum toward solving for this, knowing that PennDOT's going to have ultimately final say yeah. in the exercise. Um, you know, so what that actual answer is going to be is going to require, you know, A, just continued showing up, um, yeah. okay. right? Be a pest, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of the, the, the nature of it. Um, you know, keep, you know, also uh, mention it to your commissioner. Uh, Silverman, okay. um, you know, yeah. bug him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. um, and again, talk, talk to us. You can always reach out to me. I'm Andrew Flynn. I'm the uh, Ward 5 Commissioner. Um, you know, because obviously mobility is something that we're going to be working on. Um, we are going to be undertaking an active transportation plan. So we're looking at the entire municipality in terms of active walking, biking, those types of things. Hopefully that's going to inform a broader strategy. Mm -hmm. So that we can take all these pieces together to end on and say, this is the overarching plan that we're trying to implement, as opposed to just focusing on individual pieces. Oh, so hopefully know. building momentum mm -hmm. to get them to see kind of the broader strategy that we're trying to implement. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, we can fight, you know, butt heads with PennDOT for a long time. Um, but if we come with a bigger kind of perspective, they can go, okay, we see where you're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. um, Sadly, there's no simple answer. I'm just hoping we can get it done before my kids are out of school. Yeah. <laughs> we can go through the front. That's a good goal. <laughs> Thank you guys. I appreciate your time. Thank you.
Paper Street actually paved? No. That's the house. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I think I have two things. So for the paper streets, it's not like all along the right of way of road or something. Like theoretically, there's a maximum of like four properties involved. So typically, there's typically. I mean, I'm sure it's it's more likely than not that somebody's gonna be like, I don't want to kids walking behind my house. But theoretically, you have a decent chance of getting all four property owners to or you could potentially buy uh, does it sub subdivide a lot and buy a strip? It's not really part of their lot. There's a lot of legal. So it's like yeah, it's like permanently just. It's not black and white. Legal. There's there's like a lot of different even from one paper street or unopen street to another. There's a lot of nuance with that with state law. It goes way back to you know original uh, law of Pennsylvania for for uh, road law. So. I, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to try and explain it, but there's uh, everyone in that development has rights to that. Are they allowed to indicate if they would allow us to put some sort of I, I don't there? know the answer to that. Oh. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll put it this way. So when I first was elected, I talked to the manager. I said, I want to think about how do we activate the paper streets for other types of mobility. Um, and he said, can I we do this after I retire? Because <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's very messy. Um, again, where I go back to, again, with the active transportation plan, one of my hopes is that we can at least include them as part of the framework or thinking, because every paper street is going to be a different set of legal hurdles, a different set of considerations that are going to have to be kind of brought together. So for my first argument is let's at least kind of start pinpointing those places where we really feel it's important to pursue those. Because it's going to be a one-off kind of grind exercise, paper street by paper street. Um, some people will say, hey, please do it. Um, you can have it. Others will say, no, I don't want anybody walking there, and I'm not going to agree. Right? There's, there's legal issues. Right? If we take over that area, we now have responsibility for maintaining it. So there's long-term you know, infrastructure maintenance costs that we have to take on. Right? So there's lots of variables that are going to come into play. So for me, it's let's look at the active transportation plan, understand the overarching strategy, put those on the table as options to pursue, knowing that they are going to be, you know, a longer play. Okay. Another. I'm kind of inclined to add this to my like a uh, list of potential things we can uh, send in a like nice letter to Dan Miller or somebody about like little things we'd like to see improved in state law. If it's a, you said it's just like a dead end that like disappears. Like it's not even owned. The, the, the paper tree is like not owned by anyone after the 21 years. It's just like everyone it, within that development has rights to it. The okay. municipality does not. The government nobody does is not. It. Technically, no. My, under, my understanding, the way it's been explained to me over the years. Uh, the other thing is about Kelso. What was it? Oh, yeah. So um, in the past, we reached out to. Um, PennDOT, and they said the speed limit is correct based on their um, whatever oh, codes they're looking at. Yeah. So have we maybe we can try the opposite approach where, I, I mean, I, I see highway departments building sidewalks in random places all the time because it's just part of their standards. Can we, is there anything, maybe we can point at Kelso and say, the lack of sidewalks here doesn't meet your current standards. Put them in, maybe. Well, I think that's part of the sidewalk policy as far as, far as the analysis of each individual street. So you know that that's part of it. It's it's speed, it's traffic volumes, it's the necessity or the need or you know, community need for for pedestrians uh, to have safe walking routes. So I think that's all part of it, and I think that's going to be addressed to one extent or another with the active transportation plan. That'll all be part of it. And so we I don't can post signage, works. like not necessarily like alternate speed signage, obviously, or stop signs or so on, but we can post other signage along that street. Is that correct? Even though it's a state street. If it meets the warrants. It, it has to meet yeah. traffic warrants, right? Okay. You can't just 
can't use stop signs as as traffic uh, calming devices. I understand. There have well, to we be certain do, like you know uh, child walking areas or you know something that would at least signal a driver as they're going. Usually signs. What I've what I've my understanding is, and I don't want to sound like Mr. Negative here. No, all the time, but I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> tell you what I'm yeah, like we want to think creatively out of the box of but, what can we do. But the signage gives the pedestrians first of all a, sense, a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. And the drivers really, once you reach a certain point, drivers don't see the signs anymore. So uh, it just becomes pollution to them and they don't pay attention to them. So that that's my understanding from a lot of the things that I've read, the studies that have been done. There was a sign pollution effort right. probably 20 years ago. I mean, it, it's been a while, but we actually, through the police department, a traffic unit went and did an analysis and they tried to eliminate signs where there were just too many of them because... Overload. Exactly right. It's overload, yeah. and you just start to ignore them, especially because a lot of the problems in the residential areas are people that live there anyway. So you just get used to what you see on a daily basis. Right. And you really don't pay attention. I mean, there are needs for certain signs, you know, like crosswalk signs right. and things like that. But to, to you know, a warm motors of that. But as they approach those those areas of concern, but you know, like the kids at play, those type of signs that you see, people don't really pay attention to those. I mean, it it, it it doesn't seem to be beneficial. Um, the... No, I, I was I apologize, to everyone, that I, I'm late and had the calendar invite wrong on my own calendar, so I'm joining virtually. But um, you're exactly right, Rudy. I really caution against signs. That road, as signed, is 35 miles per hour, and the cone of vision is basically if there, there's a lot of different graphics that show. If people are going 30 miles an hour, they wouldn't even see the sidewalks or signs within that context. And they're not going just 30 miles an hour. So it's really a road that is comfortable to go fast for people driving. And it, it needs other visual or structural changes to it. Um, I would I would push back. I mean, I don't know when the last time we talked to PennDOT was. We have a complete streets policy now. But this is a road that doesn't really match um, the context and it also links into a transit, the transit system to some effect. Not, not a high frequency uh, stop, but it is a transit line that people can't get to now on sidewalk, and and it is an opportunity. So I, I think there's plenty of room for change on Kelso, uh, and we probably should revisit the PennDOT conversation. And then what about the, um, you know, because we were to to look at these sidewalk situations on Kelso specifically. But even if you were just visiting a friend or, a, you know, an Amazon delivery, you can't pull over it, right? So, I mean, I know that's not really what we're talking about, but it is, it's also a concern of just why is the, why is it designed that it's not highway, like, right? you know, like people need to, you know, have pizza delivered, whatever, or, you know, you stop by to drop something off at a friend's house, like you you can't do anything anything like that if you're on Kelso. I mean, I've, I've seen people parked along that road. I mean, you yeah. know, it's not frequent, but those type of activities, yeah, I've seen it along there. So, so I don't, I don't believe it's posted no parking. I believe right. it's. I think you can park there. So would car there slow people? You know, like so have an impact. I mean, you do have to slow down when there's a car parked there, and if there's a car coming in the opposite direction. Right. I mean, it's probably difficult. To park and then get out, you know, if you're opening your car door, but um, I don't think we want to encourage that, you know, it's, I know. it's not safe either, you know. No, I know, but that's I think all part of this, you know, right. and, and just um, and then even if, you know, there were sidewalks and you wouldn't want people like pulling up on the sidewalk either, you right. know, so yeah. Which yeah. Is mostly likely what's we, we've seen all right. if you did the study or drove around I'm sure all of us saw plenty of vehicles like parked up on the sidewalk as well uh, or you know up into the median area mm -hmm. well that's definitely a violation too with a motor vehicle obstructing right. a pedestrian right away so right Mike. Mike has yeah something. i just wanted to say i looked up the um uh pen dot did we, we made the request in november of 2022 and they issued their summary and uh Conclusion letter on March 16th of last year. So it was it was just a little over a year ago. And it essentially says we we conducted this study and that the speed limit on 
State Route 3034 Kelso Road is to remain posted as 35 miles per hour. And then they even made us add some posted speed limit signs because there weren't enough in the right places. So it was only a year ago. I love to ask another question. Sure. So what is the point of that speed limit sign after the, the child was hit? Why, why were you guys collecting that data um, if you already had that information from PennDOT? Like, so I'm just trying to understand, like, the, the request of PennDOT was to that. reduce the speed limit. But I'm I'm talking about the speed limit sign the police put up after that the was to record. That actually has a radar on it built into it, right? And it, it collects data. Every car that passes that, it senses the speed of the vehicle um, and the traffic count. So we were trying to see how many cars go on the uh, travel that road and how fast the average speed is of the vehicles. Once you got that information, whether they're obeying the speed limit or not. Did you did you have an intent to do something with that information if you found I, I don't know what you'd be looking for exactly like what, if there are certain marks but did you have an intention to use that information to then take a next step? Yeah, that's why the data is collected just to okay. get real real data of what's really it, there's perceived speeds and then there's for instance the we had someone here at the last meeting from Roycroft that said that tra vehicles are going maybe sixty miles an hour. And the preliminary data that we've found from that is there's no vehicles that ever went faster. The average speed was about 24 miles an hour and it posted as 25. Mm -hmm. I think the high speed was 30 miles an hour. So it's just to get real data of what is actually happening on that street so that the engineers can then make the determination on what can be done after that. And, and if our results you know, found that it was significantly outside, we would obviously raise that again with PennDOT. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's kind of what I was, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, if, it, if it had been like outside of the, what we would have anticipated, yeah, it, it would have been a resource for us to leverage in that gotcha. conversation. Okay. Yeah. The pro problem is that uh, also isn't a local street where someone's using it as a cut through or speeding. It's a state highway functioning as it's intended and there's just no of uh, allowance for pedestrians. It's arterial. I mean, they use it for cutting through from Painter's Run and Gilkison Road up to Bar Hill Road. So it's so, so the legal speed is dangerous. Well, I, I don't. Well, I, I think mean, it's the proximity it's of a of a state road to the community is, uh, itself. It's not. I mean, it's it's more a function of where the houses and the foot traffic is across the state road. Does road ownership impact what we can do as far as sidewalks? I mean, it's not our right of way, it's a state right of way. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I know there are probably about 15 houses when I was driving through that have short segments. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not connected. Right. right. Who put those in? Probably the homeowners originally, or at some point in time, the homeowners, I would say. That was very generous of them. <laughs> yeah, it's odd. They've been, yeah, no, it's very, it's yeah. like, you know, sporadic. Like you'll see a little. Maybe they were trying to like make it spur a, a revolution. I'll do yeah. it if you do it. Yeah. It, it, it also may be, um, you know, the rules are different today. If you develop a property, you have to put a, a sidewalk for pedestrians in the right of way. Back in the day. So okay. maybe they were developed at a later date than the other properties, potentially, possibly. Okay. I, I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. It just sounds like a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> so in our sidewalk, if we came to consensus that we as a group, and I know we aren't to that stage yet, but we said Kelso should be next, but we don't even know if Kelso is able to be sidewalked at, at this point. I think Ben would have to be involved in that conversation okay. because it's their right of way. Okay. But the more lo the roads that we own locally, we don't, we're just, we can do sidewalks on them. There are municipal right of way, okay. municipal street right of way, correct. Seth, do you have your but, hand? But oh, the, the sidewalks are still owned and maintained by the property owners. Okay. So even though we can do them, mm -hmm. all the sidewalks are the property owner's responsibility on their property, sure. even though they're in the right of way. The right of way just gives the municipality the right to go in and maintain utilities, the edges of the street, the okay. plant trees, those type of things. Yeah, I was just going to I was just going to ask if we've engaged PennDOT's uh local technical technical assistance program. Uh I know Dormont has engaged with them and and they have a team that's not just PennDOT uh officials, but I believe they've contracted with Pannonia Associates to sort of come out and get another set of eyes on it. 
maybe there's, I, I'll look into that a little bit more and share it, but maybe there's a way to engage the LTAP program to get a little more information on what we can or can't do with PennDOT right-of-ways through our, our community, because the, the context does not match the fact that it is a state road. I have to assume the sidewalks were built maybe when there was major utility repair or something else. I don't, I don't see, Pen, PennDOT's not in the business of building sidewalks, so I can only see Mount Lebanon kind of pushing for the construction of those sidewalks in the past, maybe related to a utility effort. But yeah, I think engaging, If I, first question, have we ever engaged the LTAP program through PennDOT? And if not, maybe there's a way to, to go through that to get a little more um, engineering support specific to this effort. We might have an answer. Yes. <laughs> We have we have engaged with the LTAP program and with Pannoni in the past. Um, it was several years ago. Um, we had them, I think, look at five different roadway kind of segments and areas, and they came, you know, they came up with just some, you know, low cost, you know, signage, pavement marking type of things that, that to, to enhance, you know, awareness of motorists and pedestrians. That was a number of years back, so uh, it might be worth another another reach out to them. Seth, you're gonna um, reach out. Uh, yeah, I guess you know. Do do you want me to reach out, um, or Rudy? Do you want you know to reach out? I was gonna find out who Dormont specifically working with because my uh, understanding from them is they got pretty good, you know, more advanced technical assistance than that. Uh, you know, markings, roadway markings, and signs are never gonna be our solution to a Kelso road. So um, if if they've got a different mindset on it, uh, I think that would be a great way to go. I can make the initial outreach and just CC Rudy and and the folks here, and we can go from there to see if there's something um, that works for us. That's okay. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I I've attended the LTAP seminars, you know, as recently as a month or two ago for uh, traffic studies, just to see what we're getting into or whatnot. So, um, you know, I have attended those virtually and in person. So I, I can reach out to them. I know that they're. A little more involved now than they were five, ten years ago. So I'll reach out. Thanks, Rudy. Seth, are you taking the chair of the meeting over? I I don't I I, I would I would defer to um, you know Charlotte to be honest since she's in the room. I think that was something we talked about initially. So if, if that's okay, Charlotte. Um, yeah, that's fine. No problem. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'm the Mimi in the room, so, <laughs> and I'm speaking on behalf of my grandchildren, and it's about Kelso Road. And I just think it, the ball's been passed. Oh, uh, Pendot will take care of it. Oh, no, the municipality will take care of it. Just seems like you're throwing the ball back and forth to each other, and nothing's being done. Um, and then Laszlo's um, being hit, you know, really brought it all home. Um, so suggestions would be for speed bumps. I don't know if that's possible. Um, uh, painting the crosswalk a little bit brighter or so that people would notice it. Even the sign showing children crossing is, is a distance from that place where they do cross and that sign is very uh, faded, faded. Um, and then I have to think about this today. I said, well, I guess I have to go to uh, the next thing, the Mount Lebanon School Board, uh, because I think you all work together. And I don't think Mount Lebanon schools would like their names put in the, pa in the paper too much or um, in the news, but something has to be done about it. And it's been passed back and forth the ball. Uh, Kathy Prentice has written many letters to people, I think, on here about it, and uh, it seems like nothing gets done. That was about two years ago. So um, I'd be willing for, I, I'm willing to do anything that I could ha do to expedite safety on that street, and maybe you all have ideas about it, but something has to be done. It's, I moved here in 2017 to help my daughter with the kids, you know, and when I saw that they were crossing over, over Kelso, I was like, oh my goodness, you know, uh, what, this is, this is not a good situation. So, 
um, something, I don't know, look at all you all, you all have, might have good ideas too, but that's, or as Lazarus dad said, well, maybe Mount Lebanon School District will put a little bus, give us a little bus to, to but there's, a, there's a lot more families over there now too. There's about 30 families that um, have kids going to Mount Lebanon School District, so. Um, I don't know the, the answer myself, but <laughs> certainly we have to work on it and in a timely fashion. I mean, the ball's been passed back and forth, I think, too much between PennDOT and the here at Lebanon. So, okay, thank you. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody online, citizens? Right. No more citizens comments, sir. Is the next part the, the chairperson's report? Yes. Yes. Uh, I I was actually I had I had some notes here and you know was preparing for the seven o'clock meeting so if it's okay I was just going to um, go through a few things and uh, try to try to keep it brief since we're running a little behind but I know last month's meeting and the recent commission meeting it sounds like obviously we're already on the Kelso discussion so I don't want to belabor this point but we're talking about prioritization and really in my opinion and and I would love to find a way I feel like we should fund all of our sidewalks you know the the CIP list we have is around $2 million. And that sounds like a large investment at first because of how we've spent money on sidewalks to date. But when we consider the longevity of sidewalks and, and we consider what they provide in safety and quality of life, they're a sound investment in people. They last far longer than roads do as long as they aren't, you know, have issues and we aren't encouraging folks to park on them with a rounded curb. But almost every trip in our community starts with a person walking if they're able-bodied and sidewalks, I see them as the minimum cost of doing business, especially when this community, you know, we're, we're picking up from the status quo, but this community and school district have chosen to be a walking school district. There is funding out there for school buses if you are not a, a walking school district. They come from the federal level and the state level, but we are a walking school district. So sidewalks, I see as the minimum cost of doing business. Uh, there's a few recent publications out. The first is from the organization Smart Growth America, and their mission is improving lives by improving communities. Their publication, Dangerous by Design 2024, finds that 7,500 people were struck and killed while walking in 2022. And this is on a national level. That's an average of more than 20 per day. Uh, you know, their, their statement is our nation's streets are dangerous by design. Kelso is a perfect example. They're designed primarily to move cars quickly at the expense of keeping everyone safe. And the crisis is only getting worse. It's, it's increasing. We are at a 40 year high, that 7,500 number. So. The, the deaths and increase of people walking is a 75% increase since 2010. And these are stark numbers. There are, the, it is equivalent of um, 7,500 deaths are roughly equivalent to a small town like Buena Vista, Colorado, the student population of Gonzaga University, or more than three Boeing 737s full of people falling from the sky every month for a year. That's a significant amount. And from 2013 to 2022, over six, almost 62,000 people were struck and killed in, within that last decade. While our deaths here regionally are not high on these numbers, and this, this document, Dangerous by Design, includes metro area rankings, I don't think it reflects the demand for walking. There are a lot of folks in Mount Lebanon that have the ability to have multiple vehicles or get people in cars or get their kids to school. They're, the, we were a little out of balance by the number of folks being driven to our schools or driven to work or driven if that shifts in any way, when you talk about Castle Great Green and affordable housing type of development that is almost two miles from elementary school, we are putting people at jeopardy by not prioritizing sidewalks. And the, the other fact of this is people between the ages of 50 and 65 and people over 75 are more likely to be struck and killed while walking. Our population in Allegheny County and even Mount Lebanon skews significantly older. We're, I don't want to say it's a ticking time bomb, but continuing to rely on the status quo only will put us in a, in a worse position. So, um, and then a, a final piece to that is, you know, about 30% of the U.S. residents don't have a driver's license and more have given up their keys. I don't know what that ratio is in Mount Lebanon. We are, like I said, we we were well connected with private vehicles and everything else, but it, 
there needs to be a bit of a paradigm shift in how we're thinking about our streets. And I hope the active transportation plan is one point, but how we budget these programs and how we budget our right of way is critical as well. Because I, I see $2 million as a drop in the bucket when the investment uh, keeps people safe. So that, that was my chairperson's report for tonight. Uh, we can move on to the commission liaison. I can't follow that. <laughs> uh, no, there, there really is uh, nothing uh, new to report from a commission perspective. Um, again, everybody uh, is still settling in with all the other uh, boards <laughs> and authorities. You know, the transitions are occurring about at the same pace as, as you guys are experiencing. So, again, the other boards are in the same essential process of trying to understand and um, adapt. Um, but the transitions seem to be going relatively well. Uh, overall, that's my my understanding, my impression from uh, speaking to other commissioners. Um, so the so that's good. Um, again, we've already talked about the active transportation plan um, that is uh, currently uh, yeah, in the process of being um, drafted uh, between uh, Mount Lebanon staff and Dormont staff. Um, so early phases of that, um, you know, you guys will see um, versions of that. Um, so that you are aware of what's happening and have the ability to make recommendations in terms of what we want to see going out in the RFP. Um, uh, other than that, um, right, lots of road construction. Um, we do have uh, things going on, um, ramping up obviously this year. So there's been lots of road construction, but we've got the Cedar Salem intersection that will be uh, going through some transformation uh, later this year, I'm hoping Next week. Next week. All right. I'm excited. I'm excited too. Um, and uh, the Salem is going to have a traffic study um, because, and part of that is going to be um, as, to help inform the active transportation plan and give the consultants some resources to be thinking about <laughs> one example of the streets that need to be um, you know, considered as part of a kind of a revamp of how we think about transportation. So uh, obviously a lot of moving pieces, but um, all all moving in the right direction. I ask a question about that. So the um, I had somebody reach, well, somebody I know who uses the tennis center a lot asking about a crosswalk on Cedar between Greenhurst and Salem. And if that had, was every, was something that was ever considered, and I wasn't sure if that might be part of that. It Salem. was considered yeah. and it was discouraged. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the, the short answer there is I think if you think about that whole space, that section of cedar from Salem down to Greenhurst or even you know, to the end of the park, I personally would articulate that as a, uh, a road through a park, not a road beside a park. But that's a big structural shift, right? Because that is a thoroughfare like yeah. Kelso is. Yeah. Um, so we, what we don't wanna do is encourage more conflict between pedestrians and cars. There's gotcha. plenty there already. Um, Right. And you could conceptually think about things like, you know, putting down a different type of surface um, in that whole stretch so that people have a visual and auditory physical experience that's different. But that was way beyond the scale of, of effort that, you know, we were ready to undertake at that point. So it's on the radar conceptually, but right now we just want to focus on that mm -hmm. intersection because we have had so many problems. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very excited about that intersection because I come down there after I drop my daughter off from school every morning. And to make a left there on the cedar coming down the hill is nearly impossible. I do have my bicycles every day. Yeah, that's where so they are. <laughs> so I have a question about what, so there was work recently on cedar curbs in this very area and maybe closer to Dixon. Yeah. But like, did we ever consider any, any traffic studies while those con construction cones were there? Like, <clears throat> And I know that's not the purpose, like you guys were working on stuff, but like, does, did anybody ever think like, oh, just like having a cone matter? I mean, does it change the, the speed yeah. patterns? Like, just throw some cones out on Kelso. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, would Ned not get upset about that? Well, I think that's actually what. Well, I, I think Sticker. Seth is going to um, <laughs> bring forward a topic a little bit later. I won't steal his thunder, uh, oh, but okay. but you are heading down a compelling direction. I'll put it that way. <laughs> okay. Well, no. that's I mean, we had talked about that even with like the the, the speed um, unit that we have that like is almost like it's not 
obstruction, but it's very visual. Doing yeah, things like true. that certainly um, do mm -hmm. help to slow some things down. Temporarily. Yeah. But we don't have like necessarily studies to say like if there's construction going on, what does that do to traffic? And and we could maybe with Cedar getting mm -hmm. major construction, like. Well, the, the work that you're talking about is part of our paving program. It's a preliminary, so sections of curves that have deteriorated, concrete uh -huh. curves, we replace those sections before we mill and pave the street. Okay. Because you have to damage the gutter line of the street in order to form the front face of the concrete curve. So it's it's demoed out, that's dug out, we put a new piece of concrete in, whatever, however long that needs to be, replace the damage section, and now we're going to follow up, we're going to be milling and paving from uh, Mayfair up to Morgan Drive, Greenhurst. So that's going to get milled and paved. So that whole section will be new asphalt, new pavement markings and everything. The other part is part of the pedestrian upgrade at San uh, yeah. Cedar. Mm -hmm. So those are two two completely different projects. Right. The, the mill and pave is just a maintenance project. So, And I, I can guarantee you that it slows traffic down. And because it, I mean, getting guarantees from Rudy, then what? <laughs> I mean, but I mean, it's construction. It's right. Yeah, it, it doesn't last forever. <laughs> Feels like it. <laughs> well, you got to give me more money there. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I work on stuff. That's right. Okay. All right. I was wondering about that. Oh, my other question. Um, I'm not sure if we're there in in, in our agenda, but like, where there are. <clears throat> like downtown, have a lot of them. The, the temporary big plastic things. I, I don't know what, like the barriers. Uh, yeah. So Flexible. I've seen them everywhere, but you know who like maintain like where, like who picks that up and who's and where do they store? Like how how if we want like traffic barriers or they're the um the white and orange yeah and they're like they look like, like the like Lego. long things that they like jersey yeah. that jersey oh there. you mean yes. the, the ones we put water basically yeah. yeah. it, it, so. it would be a contractor that's working on but i mean that's a different type of a roadway than what we have I, I get it it's different it's not pretty but but what i'm asking is if we had yeah. some sort of temporary jersey barrier physically in mount lebanon like who who where does that like get stored or moved or we don't we don't typically have any. We use wooden barricades if we like for block parties and parades and road right. closures and things like that. But yeah, we don't have any jersey barriers. That's only for like major construction if you're closing one of two lanes or you're trying to that's really to protect the work zone for you know employees and, and contractors that are working within that zone. Yeah, I hear you. I mean downtown right now, don't get me started there. <laughs> But you know, I I feel like they're they're just putting those in places on purpose to you know for our our intentions mm -hmm. here. Like I I feel like it's beyond control. I mean, and maybe I'll just to, you know take some pictures and observations the next time I see that. But I was just really curious. They're they're very obviously big, and but I just I didn't know. But if we don't have so, if we did though, an engineering firm would own them or potentially we could conceptually buy them. Yeah, yeah, if we I mean, if, if we needed right. if we determined that we needed these types of barriers, we could buy them and store them at Public Works. Um, that's possible. Um, I, but I, we don't typically do. yeah. that type of work is usually outsourced. So yeah, independent contractor comes in, if they feel they need those. Like when the, for when example, when the business the construction, yeah. <laughs> well, then right. the, yeah. the third party brings those and installs those. But like for the city of Pittsburgh. Yes, they may actually be trying to do something with a roadway. Yeah, I, I can't. I don't. Know. Right, you can't figure yeah. that. Okay. I don't leave my we'll loving it. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't stay in your <laughs> All right. That that was. Those are my comments. Thank you. Sorry, Seth. No, I was just going to add a little context there. Uh, you know, we don't have them now, and and this isn't, I guess, the new business point, but. There's a great guide out there called the Tactical Urbanist Guide, and it talks about sort of those materials you're mentioning. I don't think the city's always using them that way, but DOMI, uh, the Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, is trying to do more pilot type of efforts because concrete's very expensive. So they can sort of test fit an idea with those flex posts, with those materials, and then come back with a larger mm -hmm. construction project and do it in more permanent um, considerations. Thanks. 
Andrew, was that the end of your report? Yes. <laughs> 10 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy on the staff report. Uh, just a couple quick things. Um, South Garage uh, repairs are coming along nicely. Got a meeting with the contractor mm -hmm. and the project manager from Gateway this morning. Uh, probably about four weeks out from reopening the ramp from Washington Road into the upper level of the garage. Uh, there'll still be some work after that, probably about two or three weeks of uh, repairs, masonry repairs to the stairwells. Uh, but that's that's going to wrap up here in about a month. So early mid-July, we should be back to normal uh, traffic patterns over there. Uh, but uh, kudos to Mark uh, Quigley and his, his crew. They've done a great job of managing the traffic, uh, coming up the wrong way up the ramp and all those type of things. So kudos to them. Um, we will be, we did start, we have started line painting. Um, so the line, I'll be, we'll make that a priority over there on Kelso. Uh, for the crosswalks, we we completed one uh, today that I wanted to get done. Ben uh, uh actually uh, chipped um, Seaguar and covered the crosswalk up there by the emergency room. So I wanted to get that one back in, but uh, we try to paint every crosswalk, repaint it every uh, once a year um, and refreshing them. A lot of them in the school zones, what we typically do is wait just before school. So they're brighter as the school starts with the arrows mm -hmm. and the, you know, the school crossing uh, text and so forth that's on the pavement. Uh, so we like to leave those go a little bit later, but uh, again, we try to paint every one at least once. And it's, it's tough. We have over 200 crosswalks throughout the municipality, plus spot bars, plus pavement markings for school zones, curbs, all those types of things. So uh, when we have bad weather, it's even worse because you can't paint in the rain. So, uh, yeah. so that's that's what we're working on now. Does um, the Kelso have a light? Does it have the flashlight? It does light? not. No. Yeah. Is that what's put, is that something we could put in, or would we also have to consult the state to well, put something? Actually, the state would have to approve that. <laughs> we had the the crossing done up here at uh, Washington Mellon School, mm -hmm. and that was uh, that had to be approved by the uh, PennDOT for a crosser. Now we're going to have one on Cedar Boulevard. Uh, mm -hmm. That's our street. So we're going to have one there as part of that project. We've actually already purchased it. We're going to install it ourselves. Um, it'll be the uh, rapid flashers like we have up on Washington Road, along with uh, this one's going to have an edge lit sign. Uh, so it'll flash. Uh, it's Bluetooth uh, communication yeah. between the two. So and it's uh, LED uh, solar uh, powered. So uh, solar panels will recharge the batteries and should be trouble free. So that might be something that we could in the interim look to okay. pursue for Kelso, at least um, it, it would seem the state would be more open to something like that, at least in the interim. Yeah, I think the engineer is, uh, would <clears throat> probably have a better idea on that than me, you know, uh, but they would have to authorize that for sure uh, before we can put any sort of control devices along their roadway. Beth, you had a comment? Yeah, Rudy, I had a question regarding the crosswalks. Is is what is Mount Lebanon's crosswalk design standard? Because I've noticed some of the utilities, when they are um, coming back for their repaving, they're only doing the two lines, and those are not really the standard for high vis crosswalks. Yeah, our, our typical, uh, for the most part, we replace what's there, but we've been upgrading the piano key style uh, for the most part throughout, especially the busier roads. Some of the, the side streets and so forth where you don't get as much traffic. Uh, we basically repaint uh, what's there, and it's two parallel lines. But I think the vast majority right now are piano key style. And then kind of, kind of in a uh, follow-up to that, I know there's a ton mm -hmm. of utility work right now. How far out do they provide us coordination considerations? And I'm, I'm trying to – I'm asking in the context of the complete streets policy, like without enough time, you know, when they're coming in with some of these heavy utility projects, we don't have the chance to maybe make or um, get a good return on investment where, hey – this is an opportunity. They're basically going to repay the whole street, but we want to change maybe curb lines or we do different things. We don't seem to have that opportunity right now. And is that something we can we can push the utilities on more uh, going forward? Um, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're not really underground that much here. Well, uh, yeah. but, um, we already do that um, to an extent. And what we try to do is uh, at least uh, minimize the restoration costs that, you know, you're either a taxpayer or you pay a water or a gas bill. So you don't want to pay twice for that same street to be ripped up a year after it's paved or reconstructed. So we've worked, we're working right now with Columbia Gas. Um, they're doing a project up on Crystal Drive. Uh, they're not going to have to restore a part of that street and they, they save some dollars there. But they do contribute to our project, so we're going to rebuild that part of that street coming up the hill from Castle Channel Boulevard. 
Uh, we've had several streets over the last couple of years. Um, <clears throat> more, part of Moreland was one of those, uh, part of Broadmoor over off of uh, Scott Road. Um, we're also doing uh, People's Gas, installed a new gas main on Mapleton uh, from Byer Hill up to almost up to Ray. Uh, last year, last fall, it's a concrete street. We had that on our, our radar to rebuild it in the next, let's say, five years because the joints are starting to go in at concrete. And we had a conversation with them. They're going to contribute a substantial amount towards our reconstruction of that street. So they ripped it up. They put their new gas lines in. They filled it in with hot asphalt to get us through the winter. Now we're going to go in with our contractor and take care of that. Now, you know, we've never, when you say, um, you know, make changes to curb lines and things like that, we never looked at it from that perspective in the past. We're just trying to make sure that we're not spending the same dollar twice or costing the residents, the taxpayers and the and the rate payers double what they really should be paying. We're trying to take advantage of, of the work that's taking place. And you know, I'm not I'm not gonna say that doesn't happen from time to time. Uh where they'll they don't have capital dollars to do what they need to do. We rip the street up because it's time to rip it up and it's getting dangerous and we need to, to redo that street. And then all of a sudden they get the capital dollars two or three days years later, and then they rip a street up that we just did. So but our, our restoration standards and requirements are pretty pretty uh, uh, up there too, as far as uh, you know, we, we require a mill and overlay from curb to curb on each street whenever they do open it up, so, yes. Uh, so a couple things, just to follow on what Rudy said. Uh, Rudy's efforts save us as taxpayers a huge amount of money. Um, so kudos constantly to Rudy for the effort to get the utilities to do the work for us. Um, that, so that, that said, um, as many of you I've talked to, uh, I've said this before, I'm a firm believer that this board needs to develop the discipline to look at roads that we own farther out into the future, right? If we can get three, five years ahead of reconstruction, and get designs approved by residents and by commission and by everybody else that has a stake in it, right? We have a much better line of sight on what the future road should look like so that when the opportunity comes up, we're ready. If we're not ready, we're going to do the most efficient thing, which is replace what's there uh, because that's, that's the standard. So lots of the, you know, anytime we're gonna redesign, re-engineer, right? It really does behoove us as a municipality to have a strategy to think about how we want the streets to be designed, but that's a long process. And I'm hoping that this board will undertake that as one of its kind of foundational efforts to get ahead of the road construction plans. Um, but that's going to take some work on our part, you know, above and beyond coming to a meeting once a month. And there's, you know, I, I think we do a pretty good job of planning, but we can't, the, the, the utilities aren't obligated to do this, but, but it's to, in their best interest to do it. I mean, it, it really looks bad if you're going to rebuild a road and you have to rip it up a year or two later. So it's it's to everyone's advantage. So we, we've actually moved things around just to work with the utilities as well, because they don't have the dollars available this year, but next year they will. So we can put a road off until the next year and, and make sure that it's all coordinated. So I, I'm pretty happy with the way, it, 10 years ago, I wouldn't say the same thing, but I'm pretty happy with the way utilities work with us these days. And um, they're very cooperative and, you know, we're all trying to get the same thing accomplished and they don't want to go. I mean, Meridian Drive right now, they're replacing the gas lines on a Columbia gas is because we're going to rebuild that road this year. So that was coordinated as well. So, but, you know, we don't have their, we don't have their analytics or whatever you want to call it of, you know, they give us usually a year in advance where they're going to work. We try to give them three to five years in advance so that they can kind of coordinate and, and work into our programs because I think we probably have a better feel on where we're going to be. Our budget is pretty consistent as the dollars that we spend on streets. So we can estimate that to an extent out three to five years more accurately than they can with their PUC complaints and things that, that dictate what they have to do and when they have to do it. So... No, and I want to, Rudy, I want to give kudos to the team for, for working to try to get some of these sidewalk detours, detours out there. I think that's something we need to put, you know, the contractors and then the sign crews are a little separate. 
Um, some of the placements don't really match what would be kind of the ADA or ProWag pro -WAG recommendations. So maybe if we can get a little further ahead on what they provide from the MPT perspective, and my apologies for using MPT, what, that's, I always forget what it stands for, but um, in, their, in their plans and their documentation, um, if we can get that earlier to, to make some recommendations around those sidewalk detours, the, the last thing we want to do is have those detours, but um, it really implicates or, you know, hurts folks that are that are without um, or have some mobility disabilities. Those are those detours are tough. Well, and I appreciate your input. You know, I, I looked at it, too, and tried to determine what mm -hmm. I could do to try and improve the situation. And the contractors and the utilities are really, uh, really kind of stepped up and they, you know, they're looking to get in and out of there as quick as they can and get their work done. That's really their goal. Uh, but, you know, my conversations, it's opened up additional conversations with these contractors and utilities. I told them, just look at it from your standpoint. If you were in a wheelchair or you had the, you know, you're pushing a baby carriage down the street, what what would be your obstacle and how would you get around that? You know, try to, is it signage? I mean, there's some places you just can't do it, you know, but there are places where they have an opportunity. And I've seen them doing more of it now, just with those few letters that I sent out. So, yeah, that, I, I think that was great, Rudy. So, um, you know, we'll keep working at it. Yep. <clears throat> and the last thing I have is um, where are we at here. Line painting is done. Uh, completing the signal upgrade at Fire Hill in Washington. Uh, that's uh, the contractors back up there now. Um, my understanding is the ADA ramp was completed on the northwest corner of the intersection uh, today. I'll be opening that up tomorrow morning and the pavement markings will be eradicated, the old lines and the new lines will be put in for pedestrian crossings and the final pedestrian traffic uh, control device will be installed on a pole uh, northwest corner next week one day. So we should be wrapping that project up uh, next week, probably by the end of next week. Is it is it possible to make like a request for some spot enforcement after that's all done? Because I know with the widened infrastructure, you know, the, the stop bars or the crossing and, the, and parking in the crosswalk, while they're not painted right now, it's certainly there because of how far the um, <laughs> the poles are away from the intersection. So people just keep creeping, creeping up. I don't know if there's a request for some spot enforcement we can make. Um, or yeah, just... we'll see what we'll see what the results are after it's all completed and the pavement markings are shiny and everything. So. Good. The um, sidewalk work that was done recently on Bower Hill was like just up from the hospital. Was that us? That was, or was the county. That... Yeah, okay. that's County Road. Yeah, that that's actually a barrier to yeah. keep cars on the road. Um, that's a bad bend up there. It yeah. gets really the the wind blows across there in the in winter time. So uh, mm -hmm. Allegheny County Public Works uh, had that done. And did that they contract. make the lines to the arrows, or did you did we do that? Uh, so we, did, we, did we did. We did. We maintain the pavement markings. Yeah, but that concrete work along that. Yeah, we've been trying to get them to do that for about ten yeah, years now. Was bad. Yeah, it was bad. So that's all I have. All right, on to the yeah. uh, old business set, right? Yep, that's that's the capital budget. Yep. Andrew's our finance guy. Who's talking about the budget? Or we are. We we're supposed to be. <laughs> well, we had the conversation last week. We started with that. Um, as far as the sidewalks and woodland, I guess you guys were going to go over here and take a look at that and oh, right. give us some feedback on that and just maybe make some recommendations on to the committee that we can pass on to the commission on how we should structure. Uh, you know, and I know this is the first year of the board too. So, you know, I get our feet wet a little bit and get a little used to what we're trying to accomplish here. But um, I think, you know, year one, it's a five-year capital improvement program. So uh, yeah. we, we have something in there as a place marker or, you know, kind of a wish list type of thing. And uh, that's kind of how we approach it with all of our different projects that we have in there. So I have a question. Yeah. So I did do a site visit to the list of um, sidewalks that we're looking at right now. And on the notes, it says that Woodland Drive has already been funded. Is Part that... of it has. Okay. Yeah. And how was it? selected and approved for funding? It was a long conversation with very dedicated residents who have been advocating for this for many, many, many years. And as part of this whole broad initiative to start putting in more sidewalks, the commission determined that that was the place to start. Um, 
given the long-term advocacy and commitment of the residents to push for it. So the residents really helped to swing the needle in their favor to... That, that, well, that's been, the, again, they've been pushing for so many years and it was like, okay, you know, if we're going to start down this path, let's begin a journey. Um, and again, they had they had uh, made good cases to the past, you know, uh, boards. Um, and it's the residents that are at the end of the sidewalk starting at versus the residents at the other end closer to the school? Or was it along the entire road that people were speaking? You know? uh, so my understanding is that, well, the, the people who were initially were really pushing were at the lower end. Is that the end that's approved? Is that what the, we're calling The end that has, yeah, we've already said, yeah, okay, we're going to do that. Um, the people at the upper end have said, wait a minute, why, why aren't we doing the whole thing, mm -hmm. right? It, there's some danger issues, visibility line issues on the lower end, which was the initial driver um, from residents, um, as opposed to we need to start at the school and work backward. But actually at the last commission discussion session, I think that it actually was the kind of context was, well, wait a minute, why don't we just do the whole street? So we actually, I anticipate at the next commission meeting or maybe the subsequent one, when we are looking at un, uh, unreserved funds and the utilization of it, I suspect that we are going to approve the entire stretch okay. and just get it done. Okay. And are we on to the point where we're going to talk about any site visit that we did, or is this maybe I should wait for another time to dig deeper into this topic? Can I, can I make a suggestion? I, yeah. I, I don't know that we're looking for specifics. I think just like maybe a funding number, you know, for... The, the, this was provided as reference. Mm -hmm. So the number is a dollar value that we're going to request to get some work done in a, mm -hmm. a particular year. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, I, I would I would put it in two buckets. One is the money, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. how do you guys want to, how should we think about it from a funding perspective, right? That's mm -hmm. synthesized down to just numbers. Then there, I would say, probably separate, right? If you guys can synthesize into a document, right? And agree on a document that says, here's, the strategy. I would not want to. This this is a. I would articulate this as a business meeting. Just get through. Here's okay. here's the recommendations. Um, does everybody vote yes? Yes, and we move forward. Again, if you look at our time, sure. we are already. Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. I just so wanted we may to... actually want to look at a subcommittee that sure. basically just looks at that. So a capital subcommittee that takes on that approach. The project. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Project scope and. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, that at least answered my question. I was wondering how it was already selected for funding. So, yeah. okay. So, to create a subcommittee, do we do we have the do we have to make a motion for a subcommittee or? Yes. So, I motion that we create a subcommittee specifically to look at capital funding, to basically take the site visits that we looked at and what's um, proposed, so that we can then prioritize and provide a. The, um, a, a recommendation back to uh, full the full body of the full board. I would second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yep. Um, and I mean, well, should we have had discussion before we voted? But um, I guess that, that would have been the, the order of operations. Um, just some context to funding. You know, I, I want this committee to work, subcommittee to work through that. But, you know, like I said, $2 million is not, in my mind, a significant amount for what we're getting. And PRT received uh, about $3.5 million from the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Program for sidewalks and a, a four-mile equivalent of sidewalks. These are about uh, two and a half miles worth of sidewalks on this list. I think, you know, I don't know if we want to add additional road construction projects to those discussions. I think the subcommittee should be looking at any right of way type of projects to prioritize. Um, Andrew, I know you've talked about the whole right of way. Um, I think there's a world where we need to seek some funding to close these gaps faster. And I don't, I, I would love to be in a world where we can just say approve all of these because um, it seems weird to prioritize safety when, you know, for anyone, safety, one person hurt or one person injured or killed is, is too many. And, um, without sidewalks or, you know, you never, you never wait to build a bridge because you don't see people swimming across shark infested waters. Um, <laughs> that's, that's kind of the equivalent. Like sidewalks mm -hmm. are the base for a walking school district. We should try to find any way to fund and close that gap and, and prioritize that, that work. 
I don't disagree. Um, I just think there's a reality of we have to find the money. Um, and finding the money, whether it's you know Recovery Act money or other sources, requires a plan. Um, and we have to have a plan. And talking about we have problems is not a plan. Um, so again, it, it's on mm -hmm. us as a community to come up with the plans that are going to allow us to plug in and chase the dollars. Um, do, so, you, do, you, do you want this work to inform, I guess, the, so I'll, I'll cut you off there. Do you want this work to inform the active transportation plan or vice versa? Because I, I totally agree. I think we need to have, like, we got to have a working list. We can't fund them all at once or um, construct them all at once feasibly, but we can start working off that. Well, okay, so here's my take. And again, I'm not on this board. You guys are on the board. Mm -hmm. um, my recommendation would be start with the sidewalks, mm -hmm. right? Because that, that is clear line of sight right now, right? It is funding that is coming from the municipality. The commission is behind getting funding lined up against those sidewalks. It's a good place to start. Figure out the, mo the motions that need to happen. Right, we're, as Rudy said, this is first year trying to figure out how to make mm -hmm. this all fit together and work as a collective body. To your point, this is a whole right of way discussion. Um, right, there there are lots of variables here, but that gets really complicated really quick. Seth, I know you know that, right? That's but we got to talk about road surface types and road surface widths and trees and utilities and sidewalks i mean there's all the variables that come into it so starting to think about capital at a bigger level right starts wrapping in lots of other variables that i i would hate to throw this all into a pot at once because i think everybody's head would just explode and we would all get frustrated um better to build you know out and have some strategies to think about this and start you know creating momentum i would also like to you know once we start getting momentum here wrapping in the financial advice, financial management advisory board, um, because I think that they will hopefully have some expertise around how to think about it from a financial perspective. Um, because again, this board ultimately, yes, does need to take into account funding strategies. My most important thing for this board is the strategy for what we want a right of way to look like and to accomplish for us. Knowing that funding is a necessary and critical part of the discussion um, strategically, but I've got to get the plans in place before I start trying to, you know, put all the ducks in a row in terms of funding. Is that fair? I mean, that's just, again, my take. Oh, I, I think, yeah, we, we'll, we'll be like putting fingers in the dam if we just keep going um, right. to the place. So I, I think sidewalks is a good place to focus and, and start making this apparatus and start with this, this subcommittee. So... Um, any other discussion on the subcommittee? I would just suggest that you need subcommittee members. <laughs> <laughs> any any volunteers? Well, yeah. How did how you know how many is a minimum? And then you, know, you can't uh, have a quorum of board members. Yeah. But other than that, you, and you are a de facto member of every subcommittee. Right. Other than that, you can have any board member, and you could have outside residents, other people as well. Well, maybe we uh, start with, I, I think a minimum of two representatives from this board and oh, go ahead. I made the motion, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to sit on a, on, on the capital subcommittee. I've, I've got some experience with you know large capital projects, so happy to do that. I look at it this way is that our role will be to help advise on current capital, like that's already been approved and expenditures just you know, to, to advise, but also to hopefully then look beyond the current so that we can work, whether it's with the financial um, uh, board um, and and to, to hopefully look further down the line on what can be done in the most um, fiscal way. But yeah, I think, um, and, and Beth, did you second the okay. motion? Okay. Um, do we want to start with those two? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we want to start with those two for the subcommittee, and then maybe extend, like you said, the invite to community members. I, you know, this is a space. Um, you know, I think I don't want to assume anything in this room. There's nobody in the room that I assume from have physical disabilities. I don't know if this is a space we have any contacts locally in Mount Lebanon that can speak to this. Um, I think getting voices that aren't in the room would be really helpful and beneficial. But if we start with the two members and go from there. 
Um, maybe we can craft I'm that. Three. You, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> What's that? I said you're three. So. <laughs> Let's start there, and we can we can shape uh, kind of the outreach from there. And so, Stan, now uh, going forward on this agenda, you will see a um, subcommittee update for the capital subcommittee, and it is now standing. And it will go until the end of this board, which renews at the beginning or in March, May. I don't forget. Um, April 1st. April 1st. It could be renewed at that point. But that's the basic process. So you guys have a context of the subcommittee you create. Now, if commission creates a subcommittee, it can be in perpetuity. Um, but you guys will renew it annually if you see value in it. Um, I don't see any other old business, correct? Correct. And then, um, so... Cognizant of time, I don't want to belabor this, but did everyone get documentation of the, the new business we wanted to introduce tonight, or is that what forthcoming after the meeting? I guess after the meeting. Yeah, I, okay. I didn't I didn't distribute that because it got kind of late there, obviously. So. No problem. Uh, so I believe at the last board meeting, a member of the community presented on what has been dubbed the Mount Lebanon Citizen Street Improvement Program. And the definition of said program formalizes a process in which residents of Mount Lebanon can propose and execute modifications to the streets and their immediate surroundings, enhancing streets for drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists alike. Any proposal from the program considers a variety of factors, including safety, aesthetics, cost, and maintainability. The Citizen and Street Improvement Program outlines acceptance criteria for a, review, a reviewing group who either accept the proposal or ask for modifications. In many cases, the program project shall serve as temporary improvements until a street is redone in accordance with the complete street policy. Uh, so this is this is a document that has 10 different sections. Uh, it's a lot to take in, I think, in, in this, this meeting. But uh, if we, we have the documentation, I'd like all the board members to take a look. And then uh, I think, I know this is a busy month, June and July, maybe at the August meeting, after we've had some commentary and review of this document, any questions of what this entails, uh, then we move to vote to either send to the commission or table uh, and, and reject the submission. But I think there's a lot of merit to this, a, a lot of what folks talked about tonight. There, there's a desire in this community, as you talk to people, they want to make changes and waiting. You know, I, I, People have talked about the ball being passed back and forth. Waiting uh, for a larger scale project, isn't. It, it just takes a lot of time. And we've got our neighbors in the city of Pittsburgh and other places that have done a lot of great work in the, the flex posts, the temporary materials. But also nationally, there's a lot of work happening from volunteer groups, and, and I think it's a good starting point. So um, that's any that's all I have to say about that. Without everyone having it in front of them, I don't want to um, belabor it too much. But uh, I would suggest so this is the tactical urbanism, right? So Jersey barriers could be a part of it conceptually. Mm -hmm. I think I think generally speaking, you see it as being more artistic and planters as opposed to Jersey barriers. But again, yeah, there's lots of different ways of thinking about, you know, temporary um, changes to rights of way that we own, um, right? This isn't streets that we don't own. Um, uh, so I would I would suggest, Seth, right, that you're introducing this here. The ask would be review the document when you receive it. Think about changes that you want to make. Yeah, you know, updates. Again, as Seth pointed out, you would ultimately be voting on whether to make the recommendation to move it forward to commission or not. If you vote to move it forward to commission, commission will then consider it, whatever it is you guys vote to move forward. Um, we would then authorize or not staff to pick it up and take it to a final stage where it could actually be adopted, right? So this is essentially intent. So I would suggest that shoot for the moon, Right? What do you want it to be? How do you want this framework? Whatever it is, how do you want it to work? Um, commission will say we like the idea or we don't, whatever that is, assuming we do. We will then ask staff, so Mr. Haberman, Mr. Sukel, the police department, everybody who has to think about this are going to have to opine on it. Right? That's what we would authorize staff to then undertake and look at. Okay? 
once they make their recommendations back, it would come back here. You guys would get, you know, to have you know, an opinion on what staff brings forward. But it would ultimately then come back to commission for whether we adopt it or not. So that's the process. So you guys get, this is where the sausage gets made. So if you want to do something like this, this is really where it happens. Um, there's a lot of power here and a lot of neat opportunities, but you got to spend the time to kind of create the document. I'm a firm believer that you know, the person who writes it, you know, gets 99% of what they want. Um, you guys get to write it. Um, so that's really the opportunity. So we own the document. It's our it bill, it's our bill to send to Congress. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It is your document. Yeah. <clears throat> Did we have to make a motion on the on No, not yet. We, right. no, no, it, no. Well, it's, just, it's kind of homework. <laughs> it's homework. <laughs> yeah, so Seth is introducing it as new business. Yeah. Okay, got it. It will then go on to old business for our next subsequent meetings. Okay. But I'll place it in the file folder uh, unless you want to send it out, Seth, or I can share it through Teams. Um, it, that way, it'll just be in there. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that's a good place. And then I, I was going to add, um, there's some links I think in the back end of it, but one of them is not the uh, the tactical urbanism guide, which is is kind of an what a lot of these policies jump off of. I'll try to add that as well, Rudy, if, okay. if you can add the document. And, um, okay. yeah. and I'll message everyone through Teams. I don't know if you have your notices turned on or not, but probably that's the best. That, that way everything's right. centrally located. Sounds good. All right. Um, Just ask one more question. I know, Andrew, you we're getting caught up. But I do have a question about one observation I made on uh, Country Club. So my question to you, Rudy, is there are makeshifts, and I think it sounded like Kelso has those too, where the property owner made their own path. Because like the Country Club is section with all the trees and like it's really narrow. Um, and then past Sleepy Hollow, um, you know, another section of, of Country Club, they, they literally put on their property little nice little bridge. So. Yeah. Is that legal? Technically, no. Why? It doesn't mean it's because it doesn't meet municipal standards. It, it's not ADA standards. It has to be four feet wide, uh, room to brush concrete. Uh, it's within the right of way. So technically, it does not. So well, those people can. Yeah, you, know, you couldn't pass or you couldn't, you know, push a baby carriage on some of those. They have like stepping stones. And I've seen them, you know, but. Yeah. It's more legal to do nothing than to do something that doesn't meet the standard, basically. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, well, if you that, install that, that's something a, well, from a liability standpoint. Too. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's probably why we have standards. I mean, that's why we have standards. Yeah. Okay. Got it. There's plenty of existing sidewalks that you can't push a baby carriage. Yeah. 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 I'm not, not going to disagree, but I mean, the question was asked. Yeah. So, no, I just wondered <laughs> um, about those because they're creative and they look nice, but. Mm -hmm. But they're not liability for the property owner or probably to some, yeah, I would say so. I mean, if you're walking in the dark and you don't have this, you know, the surface area that you should, not everyone's as agile as everyone else, you know. So okay. there's a reason why there's a standard, and that's what yeah. We, yeah. we enforce and we try to follow. Okay, thanks. I do think they're a good indicator of need. You know, I, I think people are doing them because of a, a need and, and it's uh, I don't want to say it's a blind spot, but I, I think they've taken assumed risk, right? Or they've had their children walk there. Or they're, you know, people that are coming to visit their their houses. Like, oh, it's nice to enter on the hard surface. Um, that area is just unfortunate in its development time period that they opted not for sidewalks in those developers or or the municipality. I don't know what happened, but um, it's really tough to retrofit that. And I think that's when the active transportation plan or anything else we talk about within the curb lines because that's that's significantly cheaper and changes within the curb lines are significantly cheaper. Um, even, even the sidewalks on Woodland, what does that actually look like? So um, looking forward to dig into this. I see the next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, July 2nd. Um, do we have any initial indication of a quorum? Because I know that's a, a holiday week for folks. I'll be here. I won't actually. I should be here. I'll be here. I won't be here. Currently, maybe. Oh, you will? Or you I won't. Will not. Zoom is an option. 
<laughs> Not if you want to zoom on vacation. <laughs> yeah. I'll send the email out like I did before. Okay. And if we have enough, we have enough. If not, that sounds good. August. Uh, without anything else, I will make a motion to adjourn. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. I apologize for my lateness and, and lack of in person. So I'll I'll correct that for the next time as much as possible. Yeah, six p.m. Yeah. Six p.m. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Bye, Take sir. care. Bye. -bye.